like so many other simultaneously vile yet amazing things that make up our modern lives. It could be said that Thomas Edison is responsible for the invention of Hollywood, though by accident. After all, a thing like this could only have come about as an accident, like Adam eating the apple or Columbus bumping into America. It was a simple mistake that would set off a chain reaction, blasting us all into the iniquitous, unholy abyss that we call the movie industry. A gentle opiate for our dark, modern lives. It all started innocently enough. The town of Hollywood was incorporated in 1903 as an uptight, Christian, no fun kind of hamlet. Voters had even decided to banish the sale of booze there. Hollywood used to be a no fun kind of place. On top of banning liquor, bowling, and billiards, they also banned movie theaters. Of course they did. The good people of Hollywood needed water from the city of Los Angeles, especially with all this talk of a new aqueduct being built. So, in 1910, Hollywood became part of the city of Los Angeles. 1910 is also the year D.W. Griffith decided he was going to take a trip out to California to film a movie about the Mexican era of the state's history. He found this cute little village called Hollywood there. The people were friendly to him, and the entire landscape hadn't consisted of 100% garbage yet. There were actual plants and rocks and things that weren't covered in hobo vomit. Griffith's film, called In Old California, would be the first film to be shot in Hollywood. Word spread about Hollywood quickly afterward. They would say, hey, you should go out and film in Hollywood. The sun's always out, the weather's perfect, the people are kind of nice. And you have to remember, this is a time when even the brightest electric lights couldn't expose film properly. It had all these locations, forests, deserts, snowscapes, beaches, beaches, mountains. It was cheaper. The land was cheaper. The labor was cheaper. But most importantly, it was far, far away from New Jersey. And Thomas Edison was in New Jersey. Fort Lee, New Jersey was the film capital of its time. Because Thomas Edison said so. Edison held over 1,000 patents in the United States through the course of his career. He also employed a guy called William Dixon, who invented the kinetoscope. Throughout the late 1800s and into the 20th century, he held most of the patents for the technologies needed to create the movies. Edison was notorious for filing scary, aggressive infringement suits against other production companies. The intent of these suits was to overwhelm his rivals. The expense would financially ruin most of these companies. So instead of fighting him, they would just sell their patents. And this made the Edison movie empire a big fat demon monster to be feared. Edison started the Motion Picture Patents Company, the MPPC, which was a conglomerate made up of Edison at the helm, and all his competitors he bullied into joining him at the bottom. It functioned as a holding operation for all their collective patents. A monster, ready to throw a lawsuit right at you. Right in your unthinkable face. Even as early as 1908, the movies were extremely popular. Especially among the immigrant populations. These were silent films after all, and much of the story was told through pantomime. You didn't need to know the language to know what was going on in the story. It was in an urban population, especially in places like Chicago, where you start to see first and second generation Catholic and Jewish entrepreneurs running little theaters. Viewers wanted a steady run of new films. And in order to get a new film, you had to buy it from a producer. And that can take a while. They have to make brand new movies after all. And that's when distributors come into play. Guys who sold lanterns and slides also started to rent and sell films as well. Edison the beetle-browed lord of no fun, sees this and decides to destroy. 
The MPPC creates a subsidiary just for the main task of enforcing rules and collecting fees. It got to the point where it dictated what releases would be available when. More popular films weren't allowed longer runs. The whole thing was just one big dead end for everyone but the MPPC. The MPPC saw moving pictures as nothing but a novelty, with no room to grow as an art form. They wanted to squeeze everything they could from it, just exploit it as a kind of carnival attraction. Still, there were people out there who looked at the movies and saw a burgeoning industry with potential for real growth. People with a real love for it, who went against the wicked wizard of Menlo Park, as he was called. Or at least that's what I call him. Carl Lemley was a German immigrant who worked all kinds of terrible, odd jobs until finally in 1906 he started his own little Nickelodeon in Chicago. Soon he started his own distribution service and then a production company which he called Independent Motion Picture Company or IMP which he renamed Universal Pictures. Lemley understood what people wanted. He was part of the immigrant class that came to the States and fell in love with movies. He knew people wanted a good story. His films were longer, more dramatic, and he offered his stars name recognition, something Edison's performers didn't enjoy. This was a new novel thing. This is something that audiences wanted. Lemley bought his films and equipment from any producer or manufacturer willing to work with him, and he refused to work with the Edison Trust. The Edison Trust fired back with a ton of infringement suits, 289 of them, bogging Lemley down in an ocean of legal fees. This is when we start to see other independent film producers fleeing to Hollywood. It was farther away, and if need be, they could escape into Mexico in order to evade Edison's detective thugs. And Edison's thugs were no joke. This is when things start to get ugly. Edison's company detectives would constantly harass independent film producers. They would look for non-licensed equipment. This led to some high-grade, James Bond-style sneaking around. Infringing cameras and non-infringing cameras were kept on set. When detectives showed up, non-infringing cameras would be pulled out and infringing cameras would be hidden. Non-infringing cameras would be fitted with infringing equipment, sneakily hidden away from prying eyes. These detectives were violent. They would use fear and intimidation tactics. They would smash equipment beat up actors and people on set, pay up or else. They were awful people. Working on a film set is hard enough. Imagine the shock and fear these people must have felt as Edison's detectives would barge in. This was all turning out to be counterintuitive for Edison. Lemley's business grew by leaps and bounds because of it. Theaters, sympathizing with Lemley, ordered more and more programs from him in open defiance of Edison. They saw Edison as a bully, with a subpar product. The first major problem for Edison came in 1911, when Kodak, who was previously bound to Edison, started to sell film stock to the independents, Lemley included. Edison's trust insisted on a strict, single reel, 16 minute standard, believing the public did not have the attention span for anything longer. Meanwhile, the independents were already working on multi-reel feature-length films as early as 1911. Finally, in a landmark case, the Motion Picture Patents Company vs. IMP, a U.S. Circuit Court decided in August 1912 to give the independents access to formally licensed, restricted equipment. The victory in court put the independents on a level playing field with the MPPC, and by 1914, the MPPC was out of business. But they were already sunk long before then. Edison and the people around him just didn't get it. They never understood what they were really dealing with. The Edison Trust came from an old school Anglo-Saxon inventor background, and the independents came from a new generation of immigrants. 
For the Edison group, the movies were just commodities. They were just silly little novelties, and they couldn't be improved. They couldn't be innovated upon. Edison eventually got over his defeat, even going so far as to dedicate Universal's new movie studio, now located in sunny Southern California. The Los Angeles area had now become the mecca of the film industry. The film industry had effectively switched its original home base of Fort Lee, New Jersey, to Hollywood, where, however shaky, it has remained ever since. A new Hollywood studio system would be put in place, with the key players being the once independent rogue studios of Paramount, 20th Century Fox, and of course, Universal Studios. They in turn became gigantic, tyrannical beasts of their own, their bellies hungry for more and more. They became great machines, great creators, and destroyers of dreams. And that's a whole other story. A story of more of the wretched, wretched things that happen here on our terrifying world.